Hi, this is Marianne Monraj for the Speculative Literature Foundation. Um, we're here today doing a craft conversation with Kate Elliott. Uh, Elliott is the author of 27 books. Um, her most recent series include the Court of Fire series, Black Wolves, and Cold Magic. Uh, today, uh, I've asked uh, Kate to talk a little bit about um, maps. One of the things that we recently discussed in our conversation with George R. R. Martin was the importance of mapping to creating uh, fantasy and science fictional worlds, which she's done a lot of. <laughs> so, and I've recently, um, I was just re reading the uh, the introduction to the new Ursula Le Guin 50th anniversary collection. Mm -hmm. She did a piece for the, the Earthsea reissue. And she talks about how she started with drawing the map of Earthsea and that that became the seed for everything that came forward. And it made me realize, oh, I've got this like big sprawling sci-fi universe I'm working on and I have done no maps. And maybe that's why I'm having so much trouble uh, keeping track of everything. So I'm sort of resolved after this convention to go home and start sketching things out. Um, so maybe if you talk a little about how you approach map, map making and... Um, what you see is its importance or its utility in being a genre author? Absolutely. I love to talk about maps because, first of all, I'm a total map geek. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have all these books about maps over the ages, and I love maps like the London Underground map, which is a fabulous piece of design. Yeah. I mean, beyond anything else, I am actually stealing it. The, the concept of it for my forthcoming novel coming out next year. Nice. Which one, um, which one is that? It says, Seth's Gender Bent Alexander the Great in Space. Awesome. And right now it's called Unconquerable Sun, but I can't promise that will be the yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's coming out in July 2020. But anyway, um, and I like to talk, when, I, we, when we think about maps, we think about external maps. Mm -hmm. We think about something we can look at. And, and it is great to, it, it is important in a number of ways to place yourself in space. Um, and I mean that either in the three-dimensional space or the two-dimensional space of a map. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, which I'll come back to in a second. Okay. <laughs> but the other thing that I have really come to understand over the years is that when people write, and I don't mean everyone, but when people write, a lot of times when they think about map making, they're also not thinking about the internal map that they're bringing to what they're writing. Mm -hmm. So I would, I'm trying to think about uh, examples I could give. So an external map might be a topographical map where we can see where the mountains and the rivers are, and we can place the cities here, and we can gauge how long it will take us to travel from this city to that battlefield or that village. Right. And especially keeping in mind things like are you on horseback and how long exactly. will that take and you have to feed the horses? And, and what so the weather is going to be like. Right. So now these things begin to develop together. But one of the other things that happens is people don't think about the internal map they're bringing and the internal map they bring to their creation, to world creation, and I include myself, is like all the assumptions, the expectations, the stereotypes, the things they don't know about. So... You may bring, um, did you see the cartoon version of Mulan? I did. Yes. So at the very end, when Mulan has succeeded and mm -hmm. she's driven out the, the Huns, I guess they mm -hmm. were, or the Mongols, I don't remember. Um, she's allowed to meet the emperor, which is like the highest mm -hmm. honor you could have. And then because the writers were working from an internal map mm -hmm. of what would look, what it would be like in the U.S., they have her hug the emperor. Oh, that right. would never, never happen. That's right. Never. Yeah. So when I talk to people about world building, I say, first of all, interrogate your own internal map. What are you bringing to the world? Mm -hmm. Are you bringing assumptions to the world about how people interact? And, or are you um, bringing assumptions to the world about what the setting looks like? Right. For example, I'm going to set, I'm going to write a, uh, an analog Japan. Right. So I'm going to have people wearing something like kimonos, and they're going to carry two swords, one shorter than the other, and I'm going to, and they're going to eat a lot of rice. Right. So yeah. these are external map things, but maybe I'm not thinking about what do those things mean to the people who are using them, mm -hmm. and how do those things relate to how they relate to their world and how they relate to themselves? Maybe. Um, 
can everyone carry two swords? Maybe not everyone can. Maybe some people can only have one sword. Maybe many people can't have any weapons. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly we're beginning, see, just, just from that one thing, now we're beginning to see layers in the society. Since what you're talking about here is so interesting to me. It, I haven't thought of it in terms of maps before, but it, it is reminding me of um, one thing we talk about is the cultural iceberg. Have you, I don't know if you've yeah. run across that concept, right? So the cultural iceberg with the sort of at the very top yeah. are all these visible signs of culture yeah. that are sort of easy to latch on to, yeah. um, you know, whatever women can't wear short skirts or, you know, whatever it might be. But underneath there's all of this um, taken for granted stuff, this deep culture that uh, you may not ever explicitly note mm -hmm. in your story, but it's going to inform everything. And if, um, you know, if you Google, actually, you find there's a whole bunch of different variants of the cultural iceberg that people have approached in different ways. And I think it's interesting seeing what they assign as above the waterline and right. below the waterline, right? right? Um, so do, does that seem like a fair I, I, analogy? I haven't seen, I have a vague yeah. memory of having heard of that. Um, I, I think that's also, that's also a great analogy yeah. because we, the, the key thing for me for will building, and I, I need to add that people can world build however they want. If they want to write U.S. suburban, you know, 50s white people in with fancy clothes because that's what floats their boat, they absolutely should. But I think when people think about world building, they at least ought to be aware. I would like mm -hmm. people to at least be aware and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. Not everybody behaves like this. Um, you know, if you're going to have a, a queen in your fantasy world and she's like, leave it to beaver, you know, sitting in, you know, sitting doing nothing and, you know, maybe sewing in the parlor while everything goes around her, then you're not thinking about her position, uh, the actual position of uh, queens as chatelaines. Right. You know, queens who said, hey, I hear there's a, uh, I hear that region over there has a famine. We need to send them some grain from our storage. This is stuff people did. Alexander the Great's mother would send wheat to places that had a wheat shortage, and that mm -hmm. was part of her job. Right, to manage the sort of, not just the household economy, but the national She's, economy, yeah, right? yeah. the kingdom and, and, economy. And if yeah. you don't, if you're thinking about this external map, because narratives that we talk about, narratives that we see in Hollywood, for example, mm -hmm. and these kind of flattened narrati narratives are also maps, mm -hmm. right? They're narrative maps, and then they become focused on the external map. So we get the narrative of women never did anything in the Middle Ages. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, people who say, well, you can't have, it's okay not to have many women in fantasy, in epic fantasy, because women never did anything in the Middle Ages. They were all pregnant, illiterate peasants who never walked more than five miles from their home, which of course is completely untrue. But if you have that map in your head and you can't see that there's another map, right. then you're, you can't, I like they say, if, if, that, if that isn't on your map, mm -hmm. you can't go there in your narrative. And I think it, it creates a, a thinness, I feel like. So, yeah. you know, if you yeah. haven't mapped out your territory externally or internally, you end up with just sort of a sketch of a story and a sketch of a, a society and a culture. Yeah. And it doesn't feel, it doesn't have the denseness and richness that, you know, I, I know that George and I were, um, were talking about Tolkien and world building and how much depth there was yeah. to yeah. all of Lord of the Rings and all the background material that he thought through that much of which didn't make it into The Hobbit or into The Lord of the yeah. Rings. It was in appendices, et cetera, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah. But he knew it, and it informed the text, and so it, it made it feel real and rich, and I think that's a lot of what grabs the reader or the viewer. I do, yeah. and, and I think there is a place for, and I think there are readers who really want that thinner because they're more interested mm. in the pacing and this thing of the, mm. the course of events you know one thing happens and then the door opens and then someone shoots a gun and that's also a form of yeah. that, that's a story and, and I think that's that's also okay but if people want if people are really interested in world building for the sake of creating what I would call an immersive world mm -hmm. where you feel like you've really walked through those streets then I do think they need I think they have to start with themselves mm -hmm. they have to start like really mm -hmm looking through their own uh, assumptions, which are barriers to creating more deeply. I know that sometimes, you know, for me, I run things by readers a lot, and one of the pieces I'm working on has Sri Lankans in space, so I'd written it, and I sent it, you know, and I'm of the diaspora, right, so I left Sri Lanka when I was yeah, yeah. two. Um, I sent it to some science fiction reader friends of mine in Sri Lanka 
Yudin Jaya Vidaratna was one of the people who read it and he said um, the conversations didn't sound right to him because uh, his experience of Sri Lankan culture, I hope I'm not uh, misquoting him, but, but essentially it was that um, people are living on top of each other, it's uh, very close-knit, very familial, and so uh, my people were too polite and they were too nice Mm. And you know, I was thinking mm. like, oh, mm. right. I grew up in the middle, and I grew up in New England. I live in the Midwest. There's a certain distance um, to yeah. you know. We don't yeah. start in in New England. You do not just like dive into conversations in the grocery line with the person standing next to you or with the or, cashier. Although you do, and you can in Hawaii. Oh yeah, well, interestingly, so, yeah. Well, and so yeah. that's one of the things I think it's well. And in fact, as I like when I moved west to California, there was much more of that, right? And yeah. so. That kind of like small interaction and the the politeness of my characters, however, like they may be seething with fury underneath, but they were generally polite on the surface. And for you to that just it rang false because it was not yeah. his um, experience of what Sri Lankans are like. And when I think about my relatives, I'm like, oh yeah, they are they are maybe not so likely to mask their emotions in that way, right? Yeah. And so yeah. and then I have to think about okay, well I've got Sri Lankans in space in a couple hundred years. Do I want them? And it's a choice. Do I want them to be more like this kind of Sri Lankan or more like this or evolving in a completely different direction in a couple hundred years? Right. And then you think about, well, what if they're all in the same spaceship or in the space station and then there's a containment? And so does that make you more polite because you need that distance or does that make you all living on top of each other and more just like we're all going to let yes. it go? Right. That's right. And, and, you know, what other external events might be yeah. impinging Going. on that? Whether is there a threatening culture that makes you bond together as a group? Um, are you all on your own? And, and how does that change things? See, and now all of a sudden, to me, that creates a richness that's greater than as much as I love and as much as I myself draw these place maps, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, geology and geography on a planet will have a lot to do with how a culture yeah. evolves and what they have access to. But, um, but now you see the richness, right? Mm -hmm. How are people going to interact? And I would actually like to say something about uh, doing research, uh, as, like in my case for the Cold Magic books, mm -hmm. which I did a lot of research in uh, Mande Malian cultures. Now, I'm an outsider to that culture. Mm -hmm. I don't know it. But, and I knew that for the, the purposes of an alternate history fantasy set in 1818, the equivalent of 1818, um, I, I, I knew what I wanted to do and I knew I wanted that as part of it because it's a it's a Europe with um, no ice age, with, with an extended ice age so there's no Germanic tribes at all so the world has developed the cultures have developed differently and mm -hmm. Europe has developed differently but I what I discovered was I had to think about let me find a couple of things that are a little that are different than how we would do things mm -hmm. that how I would have grown up doing things right and one of them is greeting so in West Africa, if two men are walking uh, past each other mm -hmm. on the road and they're both on their way to work and work is in, they're both kind of running a little late, and both, it's more important for them to stop and do this. There's this whole extended greeting sequence. Mm -hmm. It's more important for them to do that than it is to be, to work on time. Right. And so sometimes you can say, if you say to yourself, well, I'm not going to know whether it's whether it's a, com well, no secondary world is built out of thin air. Right. Right. It's all rooted yeah. to what we know. I mean, this is the thing. The assumptions are going to be there. Yeah. So, yeah. so make them conscious, yeah. right? Right. But also, so if you can find, like, I mean, in terms of tricks, I don't want to say tricks to use, craft issues, mm -hmm. craft things, is if you can find a couple of things to make sure are a little different that you can flag to the reader, mm -hmm. then that gives you a sense that then people can begin to see that depth. Or that sense of depth. Right, and I think that's a lot of what people come to genre for, too, because that, that evokes the sense of wonder yeah. and expanding our borders and our consciousness. Yeah. So I have only a little bit of time with uh, Kate Elliott today because we're here at Worldcon and she's going to rush off to something else. I have to do a panel on invisible work, mothers and caretakers, which is like a whole other and subject. And a whole other right? topic, so we'll get her back yeah. and make her talk about that again. <laughs> so, um, but if we can, um, let me just ask you to end this uh any last thoughts that you didn't get to that you particularly want to share or 
Um, and also, if someone was going to start with your work, I fell in love with Kate Elliott's work with the Jaron series, which is one of her earliest series, and I still think that's a great starting point. But but if there's one that you would recommend for people coming to you? Um, I have, actually, on my blog, which is kind of, I'm not updating much. But anyway, I have a post pinned to the top of my blog called, Where Do I Start With Your Novels? Oh, nice. And it's, <laughs> it's the books, because I, I write in different series and they're they're all in different worlds, so I have I can't remember like five or six or seven different series. But it's it's written as if you would talk about a boy band, you know, mm -hmm. which is your favorite nice. <laughs> singer in this band. So True. yeah, but anyway, it lists them all because they're a lot they're different in tone and and setting and how I approach them. That's perfect. And so. your website is kateelliot.com or something uh, else. That would. Be uh, you can find yes, you can you find, find it on Kate Elliott two L's two T's dot com or also my blog is called I Make Up Worlds. Perfect. Oh, that's yeah. so apropos for today. So <laughs> excellent. So um, thank you so much. This thank is you, great. Marianne.